Warning. The following story contains elements of drug abuse, self-harm, and abortion. You can go to the time code you see on screen now to skip past this story. I was living in Hawaii, and I had to move to Los Angeles for work. I didn't know anyone, and I was fairly broke. My job made it clear they weren't going to cover any moving expenses, so I had to resort to scouring Craigslist for a room to rent. After thousands of scams and weirdos, I finally found this amazing girl. She was funny, we had similar interests, and she even worked in the same field as me. She told me that she didn't have a place yet, but her and another girl were looking at several houses and that they required a third roommate. They were totally okay with doing all the footwork, seeing how I was an ocean away. We would call and Skype once a week, and she sent pictures of each house they looked at. All in all, I thought she was incredible. Fast forward about three months. They had found a nice gorgeous house, and everything was settled. The two girls, Yvonne and Juliana, were all moved in. Yvonne was the one that I was communicating with, and she was the one who picked me up from the airport. On the ride to the house, she starts telling me all the horror stories about her past roommates. Every single one had screwed her over in some horrendous way, and she was terrified of being close to people after that. She said she wanted us to be the people who turned that around for her, and that we should be like a family. She then drove me not to the house, but to a nearby Starbucks. She was chain smoking the whole way, and told me about how her stepdad was going to AA meetings, and she had briefly attended rehab after a short bout with a painkiller addiction. But she decided that she wasn't going to be a drug addict and didn't need it. Then, she admits to me that she had only known Juliana for about a month and a half. <laughs> Needless to say, there were red flags all over the place. Why would a Los Angeles native need to find strangers to live with on Craigslist? Why the oversharing about drugs and family? And why had she never had a positive roommate experience? I push that all aside, giving Yvonne the benefit of the doubt. A few weeks go by, and things were going well. I had forgotten that she seemed a bit off at first, and we start becoming close. She then takes me on a tour of Los Angeles for a day, and proceeds to tell me her entire disturbing life story. When I say we had gotten close, by no means were we close enough to make this appropriate. She tells me about how her stepfather used to be abusive, and about how she was the one who was sent to a mental hospital when she told on him, because he was a doctor, and claimed that she was criminally insane, attempting to end her own life, her mother's severe narcotic addiction, her ex fiance having a psychotic break and trying to kill her, her struggles with chronic kidney illness that required many surgeries, her recent long-term boyfriend disappearing under mysterious circumstances, Horrific stories that just went on and on. There was enough material to make a horror anthology film, and part of me questioned if all of it could be possibly true. But again, I gave her the benefit of the doubt. Things go on fine for a while, and my doubts about her subside. That's when my food starts disappearing. I asked both girls about it privately, Yvonne claimed that the other girl, Juliana, had confessed to her that she was a compulsive overeater. Naturally, Juliana claims that she was innocent. I sided with Yvonne, and I'm ashamed to admit that we began to gang up on Juliana, trying to get her to admit to stealing the food. Then the dishes start piling up in the sink, and nobody is washing them except for me. I asked both girls, and again, Yvonne swears on her life that it had to be Juliana. Finally, Juliana had enough. It turns out that Juliana had been eating out for every meal. We all had extremely different schedules. Yvonne had lied to my face about the dishes and the food. When confronted, she begins crying and saying, How could you accuse me of such things? I'm a good person. I'm a good person. And we end up apologizing to her in the end. However, the tension builds between Juliana and Yvonne, due to many, many 
many repeats of the situation. And one night, while I was at work, they start fighting. Yvonne calls me in a panic, saying that Juliana hit her, and she's afraid for her life. I call up Jules and tell her to find a new place to live. Juliana stayed with friends, and within a week, she moved out. Now things get really weird. Yvonne moves out of the master bedroom and begins sleeping in the living room every night. After I repeatedly request that she return to living in her room, she tearfully confesses that she's been on opioids this whole time and is trying to wean herself off, but it makes her too weak to walk downstairs to her room. I felt sorry for her, and I end up babysitting her for weeks while she went through her withdrawals. It was both terrifying and disgusting, but I wanted to help her out. During this time, I saw her naked and realized that she had no scars from her many surgeries. Beyond that, she confides in me that she hasn't been working at all this entire time, but going out to score drugs almost every day, and now she is flat broke. She apologizes for lying to me, saying over and over that she's a sick, sick addict and needs help. I get her into rehab as soon as she's able to walk, driving her every day to meetings and holding her hand the entire time. My boyfriend and Yvonne's oldest friend move in with us a short while later. We needed help with the rent. Things have been going downhill for a while, but we were now approaching a 90 degree freefall. Yvonne goes to visit her mom one night and disappears for a whole week. She returned clearly intoxicated and claiming to be sober. She starts going on many trips to visit friends in other states and was rarely home. And when she was present, she babbled endlessly about how great sobriety is and how she was finally healing and then would immediately doze off. I ended up finding something suspicious on her computer and she admits to me that she had been working as an escort and bringing customers to the house. I tell her that she has to stop and she claimed that she already had. For obvious reasons, I didn't believe her. It was around this time that she became very physically ill. I finally get a phone call from her after another absence. She was hysterical. It turns out she was six months pregnant, and she didn't know this entire time because of the effects of the drugs. Unfortunately, there was no way of carrying the child to term. I decided to comfort her through this difficult time, thinking that the trauma outweighed all the weird behaviors that she had exhibited. She had the procedure, and afterwards she disappeared for another month. I thought at one point that she was dead, until she texted me one day asking if her cat was okay. When she finally did return, she started eating all of our food, using up all of our toiletries, and sleeping on the couch smoking inside the house, and she was clearly still abusing drugs, which was not okay with us at all. At first, we tried to be nice about it, but all she did was lie, even going so far as to say her room was haunted, and that it was the ghost who wouldn't let her sleep in her bedroom. Finally, my boyfriend snaps and yells at her. She calls the cops and claims that he assaulted her. They didn't believe her, but the other roommate, Yvonne's friend, did. One night while I was at work, she uses pity and sweet talking to convince my boyfriend that we should all be friends again. I told him that it was a manipulation tactic and he didn't believe me. When I got home from work that same night, my room was trashed. I asked if he did it and of course he denied it. Yvonne had been in there looking for cash. When I asked her about it, she looked straight into my eyes and said, it was the ghost. After that, she started sending me these insane emails. In these emails, she claimed that she used drugs on rare occasion and that I had made up everything about her problem. And she even claimed that I had physically assaulted her on multiple occasions, none of which was true. We were genuinely afraid for our safety, especially after the police showed up one day and took her in for a mysterious psychiatric hold. I never found out why she was carried out of the house barefoot and handcuffed 
by four LAPD officers. After that, we just tried to avoid her. However, she got the other roommate involved. The emails that she sent me continued to escalate. At one point, she said that I had been a sister to her until the evil spirit had possessed me, which turned me against her. This was when I realized that her definition of abuse was a bit skewed, and all her stories about her childhood, exes, old roommates, and even Juliana had been complete fabrications. Of course, she didn't have scars from the surgeries. Everything she told me was a lie to garner sympathy. Now I realized, of course, she was completely mad. We found a new house, and the night before moving out, I hacked into her email. The white gloves were off at this point. Come to find out, she had been telling our landlord that we were heinous criminals. She told her parents that she had been fired from a job because of me, and she needed money. Her inbox was full of all kinds of lies. Also, we come to find out that the guy who had impregnated her didn't mysteriously disappear. He ran away because they had slept together once and she began stalking him. Just complete insanity. After moving out, the harassing emails and text messages continued and there was a time that I seriously considered getting a restraining order. This all happened about two years ago. Last month, we found out that Yvonne had died of an OD. This wasn't a situation where nobody tried to help a sick person. Everyone around her tried to help her, and she manipulated and used them. I don't feel sad that she's gone. In fact, I still want to punch her in the face. My name is Chris. Here are some facts about me. I just got out of a five hour police interrogation. I am never using Craigslist again, and I'm scared to leave my house because I don't want to die. I'll try to keep it brief, but we should start at the beginning. My new apartment only has my bed and my laptop in it. Otherwise, it's completely empty. I'm embarrassed by that, so I don't have people over often. Kinko's pays me very little. So I check Craigslist every few hours and hope to luck out with curbside pickups. I was skeptical at first, but I picked up a couch and then a table a day or two later. I'm happy to fill in some of the space, even if it's with an old lady couch. My friend Brandon drives a big F-250, so I negotiated to feed him if he helps me grab furniture and haul it back to my place. I don't bug him that much and we go way back, so he agreed to help. I felt even more grateful because he's a bigger guy and we can lift whatever we need to into the truck. So this morning I was browsing the free stuff category when I see a picture of a comfy looking recliner. The post says it has just been steam cleaned. I've always wanted a nice lazy boy, so I reply that someone is coming by to pick it up. And then I call up Brandon. It's his day off, so he books it over to my place as I put in the address in my phone and we were hunting it down inside of five minutes. We arrive in record time, blowing right through the residential streets and heading toward the warehouse district. I figured that somebody was cleaning out their storage unit. The chair sat on a corner by some abandoned looking buildings. We hopped out and I started sizing it up while Brandon put down the tailgate of his truck. It smelled like it had just been cleaned and it was enormous. About halfway through lifting it, a bright flash went off from one of the cracked windows in the dilapidated building. Brandon and I shared a concerned look and chucked the chair into the back as fast as we could. I was a little spooked and we sped off without securing the chair. Once we got out of there, we joked about being killed in an alley and I asked Brandon what he wanted to eat for lunch. He said IHOP and that sounded great to me so we drove to go get some hash browns and waffles. Entering the parking lot, this hippie-looking bicycle is shot out in front of us. I tensed up as Brandon stomped to the brakes. The tire screeched, and the momentum ended up tossing the chair out of the truck and onto the pavement. I was in shock for a second, 
And then I became angry. It must have shown because the biker took off as soon as he saw our faces. I got out to survey the damage. I heard a loud crack when the chair hit the ground. The recliner was broken. The pavement had snapped its wooden frame on impact. I was pissed. We started manhandling the now broken chair. It was difficult to lift it back into the truck. I threw it in in disgust. And that's when I saw an envelope in a liner under the chair. It was a normal looking manila thing, about the size of a piece of paper. I grabbed it and walked to the door while Brandon parked. When he walked up, he offered to pay for his own food since I had just gotten robbed. But he had shown up and helped, so I insisted. A cute waitress named Liz sat us in the far table. I hope you guys are okay. What happened out there? Some idiot ran right in front of us. He's lucky we didn't hit him. <sighs> yeah, nothing like a near-death experience to make you want some hash browns, I said. Yeah, I'm glad that nobody was hurt. Are you ready to order? We ordered our food, and Liz was being playful. Brandon took that as his cue. So when do you get off? You want to go do something later? Liz blushed. I'm sorry about him. He's an animal. Can't take him anywhere. Brandon shrugged, then howled like a wolf. Liz walked off towards the kitchen, laughing. Brandon and I joked for a few minutes. He revealed that he was in love with our current food provider, and fully intended on arranging a marriage. I offered the broken chair as a wedding gift. I then pulled out the envelope hoping that it contained a new-found hidden treasure. It didn't have any writing on it, so I pushed together its metal prongs and opened the flap. Here's to hoping, I said, as I dumped the contents out on the table. I frowned, and saw that Brandon had a matching frown. Four Polaroids in a black box the size of a hide key laid there. Liz came over with our plates. Brandon smiled at her, and I flipped the pictures over. You boys have a nice lunch. Maybe I can get you a nice dinner sometime. Brandon said. Liz nodded like she was busy and hurried off. Way to go, champ. You just scared off the waitress. I shook my head, and Brandon dug into his food. The picture showed four different people. All of them were tied to the recliner, with tape over their mouths, wide-eyed and covered in tears. Nope, nope, nope. I dropped the pictures and scooted them away. Brandon picked them up and looked at them for a second before going wide-eyed himself. His voice was really low and he slid them back towards me. Dude, these are all in different rooms. The black box thing only had a small battery compartment so I was going to wait to unscrew it when we got back home. That's when the police car pulled into the parking lot. Two officers walked in, and Liz, the waitress, nodded for a second and pointed at us. Hands on their guns, they asked us to step away from the table and lay down on the floor. We immediately put our hands up and laid down on the filthy diner floor. IHOP floors smell terrible, if you've ever wondered. The police handcuffed us and took us to the curb outside. While the bigger of the two rambled off our Miranda rights, the first cop, with a badge that said, Friendly, started in on us. Why do you have pictures of tied up people? We found them in the chair we just picked up. Where did you get the chair? We saw it on Craigslist. It was over by the old paper mill. And you two just took it? It was a curbside alert for a free chair. I needed a chair. Officer Friendly turned and started talking into his radio. Officer Valdez walked out of IHOP, shaking his head. He looked at us sharply. You guys like picking on waitresses? We didn't as far as I know. You didn't say a bunch of stuff about hitting people and how you were animals? You didn't howl like a wolf? That was way out of context. We were joking, dude. Brandon said, 
Officer Valdez narrowed his eyes. Do I look like one of your pals? Dude, it's Officer Valdez. They grilled us about the chair in the pictures a few more times. I tried to pull up the Craigslist post on my phone, but whoever I'd posted it had taken it down. A big white and blue forensics van rolled into the parking lot a few minutes later. Two men holding black briefcases got out. One sprayed the chair with something, and the other got out what looked like a black light. The chair glowed in weird splotchy patterns. As soon as that happened, we got shoved into the back of a cruiser and taken to the police station a few blocks away. The cops got a lot rougher then. I got shoved into a tiny room and handcuffed to a table. It smelled like piss. I don't know how long I was in there for. It felt like forever. With just a tiny window on the door and that weird wire stuff in the glass that makes diamond patterns. Finally, a balding older man walked in. He had a friendly face. He sat down and just looked at me for a while. I'm Detective Bradley, and I've been assigned to the missing persons case involved with this. Let's start from the beginning. I told the detective the entire story. He took notes the entire time without showing any emotion. Then he walked out without saying another word. I sat in the room, sweating and panicking. 30 minutes had gone by before he returned. He strolled back in, sat down, and looked at me again. Okay, your friend just told me about what really happened. So again, let's start over from the beginning. What the hell did Brandon say? I went into the entire story from top to bottom again. By the end, I was exhausted. Where are your friends? I don't know where they put Brandon. No, no. The other two. I have no clue what you're talking about, man. I have two guys holding a picture of my missing person tied to a chair. The bloody chair. And a box with four sets of fingerprints found. None matching my guy. Where are the other two people? Told you, I have no idea. At this point, the conversation devolved into even more back and forth and retelling the story a few more times. I was angry and scared, and I was ready to lose it. I had an idea and asked for a lawyer. That made Detective Bradley really angry, but he walked outside, and I assume he was making a phone call to the public defender's office. A little after he returned, someone knocked on the door and waved through that tiny reinforced window. The detective and the guy talked for a minute, before he returned to his seat. What is the transmitter for? What transmitter? The radio beacon you had on the table. What is it for? There was a tracking beacon in the chair? Don't play stupid. What? I almost took that shit home. I think me freaking out like that made it all click for Detective Bradley. He cooled off a little and then began asking me if I had seen anything while picking up the chair, or if I could remember anything specific about the post. I told him what I could until my attorney showed up. He demanded that I be released, and then got Brandon out too. Detective Bradley stopped me on the way out though. Listen, I'm not sure if you're telling me the truth, but I'm going to keep looking. Do you think that flash you saw could have been a camera? What flash? The flash you saw when you picked up the chair. Oh yeah, I almost forgot about that. I suppose it could have been. Hmm, do you have anywhere you can go where you're not alone? I paused for a second. Whoever did this knows what I look like. The chair was now broken, which caused the investigation. Brandon decided to sleep over that night. Luckily, the flash came from the opposite direction of the license plate. But even so, I was eyeing everyone. Every set of headlights that passed by had us both peeking through the blinds. I guess you get what you pay for. There is much to tell since my last posting. I can barely believe that this is all real. 
Sorry if it sounds like I'm rambling. I'm writing this out just as much to sort it out for myself as I am for you guys. I'm also on a good bit of pharmaceutical grade morphine. Let's pick up where we left off. Brandon and I were stuck in a state of fear, barely sleeping, and barricaded in my apartment. Even the slightest noise caused us to both jump up and grab our improvised weapons. We barely spoke, but when we did, it would push us both deeper into paranoia because all we could do was speculate and it made us even more terrified. The headlights passing by at night were the worst. I would tense up every time they would pass across a window, thinking that I was going to die each and every time. I called the police station four times about suspicious behavior. They only came on the first two calls. The second time I had got my neighbor downstairs in trouble, he had to come home late and was charged with having an open container of alcohol in his car. Luckily, they didn't arrest him because he was already at home. Three days of consistent terror passed before we started to unwind a bit. The police said it was probably a sick joke that went too far. I think we both wanted to believe that, but the detective believed that one of the people in the photos was a missing person. Even though we didn't want this to be real, there was a possibility that we were in danger. However, it was around this time that we had run out of food completely, which was a big problem because I am a bachelor in a new place, so we barely had any to start with. And after three days, we were literally starving. You can only stretch a box of ramen noodles so far. That's it. I'm going to make a supply run to Publix, Brandon said. I shook my head at him. I don't think that's a good idea, man. Brandon ignored me and grabbed the keys to his truck. I remember thinking that he was trying to convince himself that it was okay. I put up my hand to try and say something, but Brandon had already shot through the door. I'll be back in 30 minutes. It'll be fine. He finished the sentence as the door was closing. That was the last time I saw him alive. I waited for five hours and he never returned. I couldn't take not knowing anymore and he wasn't answering his phone, so I called the police. They recognized the number and said to give it until tomorrow. That night was the scariest night I've had in a long time. The shadows even seemed to stretch toward me. I was sitting with everything off in the pitch dark, so it would appear that no one was home. My car never moved from the visitor section so that Brandon could have my spot, so my parking space was empty. Any small sound I heard in the darkness frightened me. In my mind, I thought it was people creeping in the dark after me. And that's when I heard my downstairs neighbor yelling about the ticket he had gotten in a very angry tone. Fuck that asshole. I hope he dies of AIDS. My anxiety intensified and I hugged my knees in a tight ball. I don't care if he can hear me. I hope he can. I passed out from exhaustion shortly after. I was propped up in the far corner of the living room, clutching a steak knife because it made me feel better than having nothing. I remember fading out while still being scared. Just a giant heavy black curtain slowly burying me. I woke up the next morning stiff. My entire body popped up as I stood. I had woken up around noon and I called up the police station again. The lady on the line said, We'll dispatch an officer to get a report from you. Just stay at home and we'll be there soon. I haven't left in five days, and now I'm filing a report? I'm really sorry, sir. An officer will be there shortly. I was staring at my empty fridge. I had this hollow feeling inside. I felt starved, scared, and I was carrying around this dread about Brandon. I have never wished that I was a different person with a different life more than I did in that moment. Detective Brady showed up at my door instead of a uniformed cop. That would save some time explaining at least. I recapped the past few days for him on my doorstep. Okay, well, before we talk any further, you haven't eaten in five days. You want to come grab some food with me? My treat. 
I really didn't want to leave, and I got suspicious of the offer almost immediately. Don't worry, I can keep you safe. I have my gun and everything. I tensed up when he said that. Oh, I get it. The detective then held up his police radio and pushed the button. Come in, this is Detective Bradley. I'm going to need a few more minutes for the interview. He then turned back to me. See? They know I'm here. To be honest, I still didn't trust him. But I was starving. Look, you can sit up front and play with the lights if you want to. I had one of those moments where I should have been terrified. But the first thing that came to mind was... Ooh, lights! I felt silly and left with him. He was being nice to me on the ride there. Not saying too much, we went to this hole-in-the-wall place called Sally's. It was one of those diners where cops usually hang out. I felt a lot better when I saw a dozen more officers in uniform at various tables and stools. They all couldn't be in on it. We ordered, and during the wait, Detective Bradley started talking. First, I just wanted to say that I'm sorry if we scared you the other day. At the time, it looked really bad. I nodded because honestly, I thought it looked bad too. We looked into the matter further, and there are similar cases going down the coast. We think it's a team of drifters. Nothing has been confirmed yet, however. I was thankful when the giant omelette and french fries arrived. Detective Bradley nodded to the food while he was talking. The way I dug into it, the waitress should have just brought me a shovel instead of a fork. So I have some news that might be a little difficult for you to hear about Brandon. I paused mid-bite. We found his truck last night, abandoned behind a shopping center. No trace of him. I don't remember moving, but my head bounced off the table and woke me back up. We're searching for him now, but I'm going to send a detail to your apartment for a couple of days. All right? I nodded, kind of. My bones felt like rubber. We're pretty sure they will keep going south. At least, that's the pattern so far. But I want to be sure. I wasn't proud of it, but I nimbly finished eating while I was still in shock. I hadn't had more than a bowl of ramen noodles for days. And I didn't know when my next meal would be. The ride back was silent. I made eye contact once by accident and received a sympathetic look from Detective Bradley. He stayed with me for an hour. He made a call back to the department. None other than Officer Friendly showed up, holding a bag of groceries. He handed it to me with a wink. I snuck something in the bottom for you. Uh, thanks. That's really nice of you. I'll be right outside all night, buddy. You just make some noise or flash some lights a few times, and I'll come in shooting. I nodded as he punched me on the shoulder softly. He reminded me of an older brother. I think he felt guilty from the other day. He went back and sat in his car. Under the milk and cereal and the microwave meals, there was a six-pack of Miller Lite. I'm not much of a drinker, but it was a nice gesture, and I ended up drinking one just to take the edge off the entire situation. I didn't remember how bad beer tasted until it was too late. Over the next couple of days, the cops rotated shifts in front of my house. The downstairs neighbor was pissed. Like, insanely pissed. I could hear him yelling about it all night. After the third day, there was a report about a posting that looked suspiciously like the others, a bit further down south. So they decided that the protective detail was over. I was relieved. I felt bad about the other people being in danger, but the selfish part of me was glad that I was safe. That is when my situation went south, along with the cop's focus. You can play all these games in your mind about what you would do in a bad situation. You can make all your little plans. You think you have it all under control and know exactly what you would do. Until you wake up one night with three men in ratty ski masks standing over you, with a knife to your neck and a hand over your mouth. 
I felt a hand grab the back of my hair. Sharp pain shot up from my scalp as the fingers tightened. I couldn't tell who had grabbed me because my vision was blurry and I was still coming to terms with what was happening. I got dragged into the living room head first and pushed into my computer chair at the center of the room. It was one of those big executive style computer chairs. And ironically, the only thing besides my laptop that I hadn't got off Craigslist. I heard that odd metallic sound of a roll of duct tape being stretched out right before my head was yanked back. I felt the tape wrap around my mouth so hard and made the inside of my mouth bleed. As the tape wound around my headrest and attached me to the chair, I realized I could only look around by moving my eyes. My head was stuck in place. Quickly I was bound by the wrists, shoulders, knees, and ankles with the duct tape. I probably should have fought more, but I had two guys holding me at knife point. I thought that I might be able to get away when they tried to move me, but now that I was fully awake and the reality of my situation was obvious to me, I knew that they weren't going to move me. I tried to struggle and pull free, but the most I could manage to do was to hop in the chair a few times. The bigger of the three men pointed his knife at me and shook his head slowly. I was now in full panic mode and it was hard to breathe just through my nose. So I started huffing really hard in order to get more oxygen. I was dizzy and I wasn't sure why. There were three intruders total. There was an average built one with a green mask. The biggest one that I mentioned earlier had a black mask on and so did the last guy who was the smallest. The one in the green mask punched me. It wasn't a little punch either. He squared his stance and pulled all the way back like a boxer. My face exploded in pain because I couldn't move my head. I saw a white flash when he connected and I felt the vertigo as the entire chair rocked back. My cheekbone and eye pounded in pain and sink with my heartbeat. The fact that one of the other guys caught the chair before it fell made me swallow the blood in my mouth in one big solid gulp. My mouth was now a desert of pain from the lack of saliva. I could tell that these men had definitely done this before. This felt way too organized to be random and I had this deep feeling of despair wash over me. I tried to jerk out of the chair again, but the tape held me in place. This time, the bigger guy with the hunting knife started poking at me with the tip and the arm at first, and then he moved to the chest. He was smiling as I tried to squirm away, putting tiny holes in me that burned as the air hit them. The worst part was that he kept acting like he was going to go deeper, but then wouldn't. This seemed to amuse all three of them. They were monsters. My vision blurred, and suddenly I was crying. It finally started to sink in that I was going to die in this stupid computer chair. Breathing was becoming too difficult. My nose was starting to clog with snot. I tried yelling for help, but the tape muffled the sound. The smaller man in the group walked over to me and looked me right in the eyes. His eyes were a lighter shade of blue, almost white. I couldn't look down too well but through the numbness of the tight tape, I felt him touching my hand. He never broke his stare. My pinky exploded in pain. I couldn't move it, and he slowly smiled and stepped back. He had taken my pinky and forced it back, breaking it. I could see it sticking up at a 90 degree angle. My hand felt like it was made of lava. I say lava because the burning plus the pressure. It hurt so bad that I couldn't even think straight. Tears began rolling down my face. I was crying for my life. Every day I wasted doing nothing. Every time I was too scared to try something. They all came back to mock me in that moment. A flash snapped me out of it. The biggest man had taken a photo with a Polaroid camera. He shook the photo menacingly. The smallest one then took a picture out of the bag and then walked over to me. He held it right up to my face, but I still couldn't make it out. When he lit his lighter so I could see better, I saw Brandon. 
tied to a chair. He was in bad shape, and he looked like he was in a lot of pain. These animals had tied him to a wooden chair. There was wiring across his body, and he was bleeding from where he had tried to yank free. After forcing me to look at him for a long time, and the three of them laughing at me as I tried to kick and claw at them, the smaller one pushed his burning hot lighter against my arm, and then started hitting me in the face with the photo lightly. It was intense, and I could smell my flesh burning. I swelled with rage in that moment, but I was able to force myself not to react. I stared into his eyes, promising that I would someday kill him. He then punched me in the burn so hard, I could hear a crack. That snapped me back into the throes of agony, which seemed to satisfy him. He then grabbed my chin and slapped me across the face as hard as he could. I felt some of my hair rip out from the tape. The entire side of my face was burning. The bigger guy waved his knife through the air slowly as he walked the few steps to my kitchen. It was only separated by a half counter from the living room. He smiled under his mask as he turned the stove burner on high. That's when it clicked. This was a game, and I wasn't a player. I was just the field. I moaned. I'm not sure if it was agony, hopelessness, or even desperation, but all these feelings overwhelmed me at once. After what seemed like an eternity, the knife came off the stove. It was bright red, like a hot coil. He then began slowly moving toward me, but kept its point focused on the same spot, step by step. I started to feel the terror. Another step closer confirmed it. He was pointing the knife at my eye. I started trying to flail out of the chair. He took another step closer. I then fought with all my strength. I managed to stretch some of the tape, but it wasn't enough. The knife was an inch away from my eye, and I couldn't stop blinking from the heat. I could barely breathe, but I was just too scared to move, with the knife being so close. I closed my eyes as I saw him preparing to stab me. He waited. I think he wanted me to open my eyes again so I could see it coming. I kept fighting back the urge to do so, but I knew if I moved too much, it was all over. There was a commotion in the room, but I couldn't see it. My leg was on fire in an instant. I couldn't look down, but the knife was now against my inner thigh, burning me. I struggled and yelled and tried to move. All I could say was, The knife! The knife! Get the fucking knife! It hurt twice as bad coming off my leg. I bellowed in pain. I looked up and saw a blurry guy with a gun. Before that heavy black curtain of unconsciousness enveloped me once again, I heard Officer Friendly's voice. Jesus, were they going to try to burn his dick off? I woke up to the sounds of beeps and the smell of bleach. I was warm and fuzzy all over. I think the IV in my arm had something to do with that. Hey, you up? Officer Friendly asked. You saved my dick. I realized what I said, so when he started laughing, I joined in. That went on for a couple of minutes. My arm was in a cast, my finger in a splint. Bruises in different color yellows and purples seemed to be all over me. Thanks, Officer Friendly. You saved my life. Uh, don't mention it. I was just doing my job. I'll have you all patched up in no time. Do you need anything from your apartment? I nodded yes, and started to get up to go pee. Uh, do you need help to the bathroom? Uh, I think I got it. I'll let you know. I managed to get in without too much trouble. Half of my face was deep purple, and the eye on that side had filled with blood. I resembled a B-movie monster. I felt like I should have been more upset at the time, but I was still warm and fuzzy. The state is picking up the tab on this one, so you don't have to worry about a bill. Officer Friendly said through the door, Oh, that's nice of them. 
You don't smoke, do you? He wheeled me out to the front, where the smoking area was, and he bummed a cigarette off a woman who was sitting there, then came back and handed it to me lit. So your neighbor called in a noise complaint and said you were having a party. Me and Valdez knew it didn't sound right, so we took the call, and we saw a nondescript bad guy van outside your apartment. Pfft, imagine that. Saved by the guy who wanted me to die of AIDS. My tone was pretty matter-of-fact about that, but I was still a bit stoned. Well, yeah, he accidentally saved your life. I started to chuckle. Well, you did say make some noise. I would have flickered the lights, but I was a bit tied up at the time. Friendly just shook his head. You know, I should arrest you for that pun. <laughs> so how do you think they found me? He paused for a moment and took a more measured tone. We found your friend's cell phone in the van, and it was still logged into Facebook. You gave your address to him several times, and I'm guessing that's how they found you. But hey, do you want me to run by there later and see if they'll let me get some stuff for you? Yeah, thanks. I just really need my laptop. Hopefully the scene will be all cleared up by the time you get out of here. Most of the evidence was in the van. You're not going to get in trouble, are you? Well, I think we might get a medal after what happened last night. I'll be back in 30 minutes. You get some air. I finished up my cigarette, and the lady patient sitting in the smoking area let me bum another one. We chit-chatted for a while about nothing, really. She had just got done with a foot surgery. We didn't get along very well, but it was still a nice enough distraction not to think, though. Officer Friendly showed back up five minutes early. He had my laptop, a McDonald's bag, and another plastic bag, and he handed me all three. The McDonald's bag had a Big Mac and a large fry, and the other bag had two packs of Marlboro Reds and a lighter. I ate the Big Mac in about three bites, and then started shoving the fries in my mouth. I then realized I hadn't said thank you. So as I was trying to swallow and look up at him, the most I could manage was a thumbs up. Eh, uh, don't worry about it, kid. I'll stop by to check on you again tomorrow. Are you good to head back to your room? Yeah, I'm good. And hey, thanks for everything. No problem. You heal up, and I'll see you tomorrow. I then offered the lady some french fries, and she ate some with me. Now, we were best buddies. I then had one last cigarette before heading back to my room. I had to ask the receptionist at the counter where it was. My laptop was completely dead, so while it was charging I sat back and tried to reflect on what happened and sorting it all out in my head. Trying to type all of this with a broken pinky is challenging. I'm still hoping that Brandon made it. Part of me thinks he probably didn't, but I don't know for sure. There haven't been any reporters yet. I would think that there would be at some point. I was debating moving, but there's a certain comfort in knowing that every day in that apartment is never going to be the worst day for me anymore. At least, that's how I look at it. After all this, I think I want to go back to school. I've always had an interest in making movies, and I think I may just have the perfect script. Anyways, I'm feeling a bit woozy again, but I'll leave you with one last piece of advice. Just go to fucking Ikea. 100% less murder, plus tasty meatballs. There's always a reason to be afraid.